Hello again, and welcome to RBCM at Home. Like many of you, the staff of the Royal BC Museum has been asked to work from home during the pandemic. And in this series, we're going to explore what that looks like. We will visit with members of the curatorial and collection staff and discover how they do their work, how their work is reflected in their homes, perhaps, <laughs> and what they are working on now. Today, our presenter is Dr. Lauren Hammond. He has been the curator of history at the Royal BC Museum since 1997. As a curator, he guides the growth of the collection. He works, uh, he, sorry, he guides the growth of the collection. His research helps to develop exhibitions and publications. And, it, and Lauren, it looks like you've got a nice setup there at home. How, how's it going for you? Uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's just like for everyone else, I'm learning new software, and new technologies, um, but it's starting to settle into a bit of a rhythm. Uh, all the curators get together online and we just sort of ch chat to start our day and talk about, you know, the feeling of working at home in isolation. Uh, for me in my home, uh, um, uh, my, my partner, my wife is uh, also working from home. So she's a couple of rooms away on the other side of the kitchen and she's doing her work, which is for the attorney general from there. And, uh, so a lot of civil servants, uh, not just the museum employees, are, are settling in to keep the business of what we do happening. And I just did a digital work plan and delivered it to my supervisor saying, here are a whole bunch of things I can do to help us with collections, with digital outreach, and here's how I can fit some research in, which I know I can do from home. So, Excellent. And I think you're going to you share a little bit more, more of that with us today. Well, what I'm doing right now is one form of outreach. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to go online and, and uh, join an international forum of museum professionals talking about how they can adapt to being more digital. Um, one of the positive things is this is going to really change a little bit how we work and how we reach people. We're all learning new tools and some of them are fun. Uh, for example, on this one, uh, I can actually give myself crazy backgrounds. So there's Aurora Borealis, or I could take a brief vacation to, to Hawaii. So uh, some of this is, you know, fun and, and kind of interesting. So now we're talking about what images should we select from our museum, from our galleries, from our workplace that we can put in as backdrops. So, but this is the first time we've been trying to use this technology. Uh, other things I'm doing is I'm working with our pathway program. They're going to put some material online about orcas and about Helmican House. Uh, I'm working with another curator preparing an exhibit for next year. Uh, and I can get into the collection database from home and do searches and, and work on group documents and suggest, you know, why don't we use this one with this collection number and here's why and here's, here's why it might be a good fit for the uh, it, the exhibit we're planning after the exhibit we are currently building. So uh, there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we can't do. You know, I can't go to a file cabinet and look something up. Uh, but there's a fair amount of work that, that can be done from home, and we're sort of trying to plan that. Uh, yesterday, I, I went to a conference board of Canada briefing on what does this mean for the economy, and was surprised to see that they were putting up postings about how to fall into a routine for working at home. And they talked very much about the need to have specific goals of what you're gonna achieve this week. And I'm finding I need a little more exercise because I'm at the computer more than I would be. Uh, in the museum, I'd be running down the stairs, going to meetings and going up, and talking to somebody and going across to the other building to eat my lunch and back and forth. So I've got to really work on, on what I'm gonna do. And after this, I'm gonna have some lunch then I'm going to go out back and split a little bit of wood uh, just to get some exercise and go for a walk and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, we're, we're doing regular, you know, seven hours a day work and, and uh, trying to really make sure that we support each other and have a good routine. That's so important. Uh, uh, the other thing I'm doing is we're pretty fortunate as civil servants that we have paychecks. A lot of people don't, so I'm sort of reaching out to do things. The Humane Society needs somebody to foster dogs, signed up for that. 
the Victoria Foundation is raising money uh, uh, for street link shelters and programs like that. And I'm putting money from my regular paycheck into those. And I'll be doing that every, every payday. So, you know, there are things you can do in your neighborhood to, to help, uh, even though you're working at home and somewhat invisible, you can still reach out from your house and do things. That's great. Uh, Lori, maybe one of the ways you can work out is lifting some of those heavy books you have. You were showing me <laughs> some the other day that were uh, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, uh, Kim's seen this one before. Um, so a lot of my work library is in the museum, but and that means I'm a book addict. And, oh, and uh, one of the things I've got here is <clears throat> this massive book on the fur trade. And you can sort of see how huge this thing is. That's the sound of it falling on my table. Um, so I've got a few other things that are quite large. I was looking for this tiny little book that's about this big. Uh, where, where am I? There I am. But I couldn't find it. It's too small. Uh, here's the, the 1958 BC Atlas, which is just massive. Um, and this is the kind of thing you'll find in the basement of a, of a historian with a big pile of BC history books and things like that. Uh, one thing I wish I had is Michael Leyland's getting a lot of awards for his latest book, uh, which is on the Natural History Society on Vancouver Island. Uh, this is his land, uh, uh, the land of heart's delight, early maps and charts of Vancouver Island. Uh, what else do I have here? Um, I like reading this book, Energy and Civilization in History. Uh, it's by Vaclav uh, Samil. Oops, let's see if I can get that centered there. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Manitoba and he's a world expert on societies and energies. And this is a book which has been reviewed by uh, Bill Gates, who that he's you know, like one of the coolest minds on the planet. And he's a Canadian uh, thinker on energy. Um, I have a big library on Canadian environmental history. And my friend, uh, uh, the geographer Graham Wynne, edited oops, this volume of BC Studies, which is a collection of essays just on environmental change in the landscape of BC. Uh, what else? Don't know if I'm going too fast. Um, oh, somebody's asked how many books do you read at any one time? Um, six, <laughs> something like that. I usually have uh, either a book on the history of music recording engineers, uh, or a murder mystery from Edinburgh or Norway or something uh, in my book bag when I go to work and I read a little chapter at a time. I'm reading Michael Connolly, which is a play police detective who's trying to solve his mother's murder many, many years ago. And that's not bad. I got that from a, a friend in the neighborhood and we swap uh, books. Um, in terms of history books, lots and lots of them. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of I, I, you do um, fields with three professors when you're working on a PhD, and I've always referred to my three professors that I studied with as my three uncles, and each of them is a little odd in a different way, um, but one of them said, books are not for reading, books are tools that you use to get information so you can do jobs. And one of the things you learn in doctoral school is how to read a lot of books really quickly and how to study up on a new topic, which you might need to do a university lecture. So with one professor, I read 500 books in a year. Another one only wanted me to read 30 books, but all of them were award-winning. So there's all sorts of different approaches. Um, when I was a young graduate school, I would carry 30 books to the checkout and take them home and then I'd lug them back. And, uh, so I have a really big book bag for books, but nowadays it's only one or two books and my lunch, something like that. Uh, and it took me a long time to learn to not take so many books out of the library. But as a graduate student, books are knowledge. Um, when I finished my master's, I drove up to the McPherson Library in a little Morris Minor and the back seat was piled absolutely up to the roof with books on the topic I was studying. 
and I took about 10 minutes just to empty the car into the book return. And then it felt so weird to walk around with no books signed out on my library card. It, it was a very strange feeling for a couple of months. So uh, one of the projects I'm doing right now is we're, we're we finished a, a book that you'll see uh, coming sometime in the next six months. Everything is delayed by current events. Uh, but we've got a lovely book coming, which is a collection of essays on orchids. So out of my very old uh, library, here's Spectacular Nature. And it's a study of corporate culture and the sea world experience uh, by Susan Davies. And uh, so I've been reading about orchids long before we began this project, and I just thought that was cool. And uh, as we were doing the, this uh, book, we talked about culture, we talked about inclusion of indigenous artists and youths and uh, scientists and pop culture and uh, all sorts of thinkers. And one of the things we decided that we wanted uh, were poets. So we have young indigenous poets uh, and oral traditions in the collection. And I said, you know, we, all, we also should have one of the older hippie poets from the 60s who were there when all of this happened. So um, Bill Bissett is, is a very sort of uh, eccentric BC poet. And this is his new collection, a retrospective of, of all of his poems. Uh, and I enjoyed having a copy of that. Um, sometimes people send you books. Um, one is from my friend Wendy Wickwire at the bridge, and it's a recently published anthropology study that's winning lots of awards, James Tate and the Anthropology of Belonging. And he was married into the interior First Nations uh, and was very active uh, before World War I on land claims issues. You hear a lot about First Nations on the coast, but less so about the interior. So I was very pleased to get a, a signed copy of that that was brought to me by my mother. Um, sometimes you get interviewed. This is Caitlin Gordon Walker. And she published with UBC, Exhibiting Multicultural Nationalism and Its Limits in Canadian Museums. Uh, so I found that really kind of useful. Um, let's see, I've got some other things I can share here. Let's see if this works. There. Um, can everybody uh, uh, see, see the screen? Kim's got a thumbs up, okay. So this is an interview that I, was done, I did about two years ago with a, a professor who works in, um, in art and culture. And uh, uh, Kirsty Robertson uh, teaches at I think the University of Western Ontario. And uh, we spent about two hours on the phone talking about protests, uh, the work in Tent City and the, the, the anti-pipeline things that are happening. That didn't make it into the book because that's too recent. But I was very pleased to receive this book in the mail. Uh, right now, these books I'm showing you are outside my office back at the museum. Uh, but these are things that, that came in really recently. So it's tear gas, epiphanies, protest, culture, and museums. And she started by thinking that museums weren't really uh, collecting the experience of protest movements in our society. And, and so she learned a lot talking to people in museums, and we've learned a lot talking to her. Uh, the reason that for the title is, if you collect, say, just the protest poster, how do you collect the emotional experience of, say, tear gas and a protest and, the, and the, the event itself? And so her book's a really interesting look at how different museums have been dealing with collecting protest and culture. I'm in there somewhere between pages 92 and 102. And there's a lot of other interesting exhibits. Uh, there's a lot you can learn from this book, and, and it's fairly recent. And I'm, Glad our museum is part of it. Uh, it'll become the, the, the big uh, text on that. Um, this one, uh, Jenny Clayton, I've got a personal reason for, re well, I like this book for lots of reasons. I like this because uh, His Honor Stephen Point is on the cover and uh, I met him several times during his term. And Her Honor Iona Campanola, um, donated the uniform that you see in that picture to our museum. And 
we went up, I went with Colleen Wilson and we collected that uniform and, and brought it uh, back and it's preserved. But the real reason I really like this book is the author, Jenny Clayton. I was with Pat Roy as co-supervisors for her thesis, uh, which wasn't on Lieutenant Governors. Uh, it was on how rural British Columbians um, um, uh, make their own rec recreation. Uh, hiking paths make their own ski resorts and their own sense of nature. But uh, Jenny was my PhD student, and so I got to go to U of Vic with Pat Roy, and jointly we put the, the doctoral cape on Jenny's shoulders, and she became Dr. Jenny Clayton. So I feel, you know, I'm a mentor, and, and I'm so happy to see this book uh, from Jenny. Um, we're looking for new ways that we could work with the, the Métis community. Uh, just give me a second, I'm gonna do something to this light. Ah, there, I'm probably a little brighter now. One of the tubes was off, uh, old-fashioned 1950s fluorescent light. Um, so we're looking for ways that we can be more representative in our gallery for the Métis experience in British Columbia. And this is a, a recent publication about three years ago, really, I think, uh, 2016 or 17, by Jean Barman. And she's examining the contributions of French Canadians in British Columbia and the, their marriages with First Nations women uh, and, the, and the, uh, the early history of the Métis community, uh, uh, which began long before Louis Riel in British Columbia. And now we're starting to see the output of her research, which is fabulous. Um, so that's something that we want to really have a good close look at as we're thinking about how we're going to improve our galleries as we go forward on the other side of this event. And this cover, which does not look very exciting, has got me thrilled. There is a guy called James Hansen, and he's quite elderly, and he runs the Fur Trade Museum of the American West. And he's spent over 60 years researching and he's slowly publishing a six volume encyclopedia. It's, sometimes it's volume one followed by four, then they go back to three and two's coming later and the, the order isn't sequential. But this book is uh, $150 US plus 40 or $60 Canadian shipping. But it's a 600 page book that only looks at textiles that were traded in the fur trade and used in the clothing by indigenous people and by trappers and fur traders. It's, it's gonna be the definitive book on it and it'll allow us to go back through some of our vaguely cataloged early collections and compare the samples of the textiles in, in this book with what we actually have. So that when we're doing things about uh, uh, Métis and fur trade textiles, we've got a really good resource book that's better than anything on the internet. And, and we have some spectacular early pieces like James Douglas's sash from the 1840s, uh, which is both French Canadian and Métis, and it's, it's a finger woven sash, it's quite lovely. Um, there are very few of those that have survived. Um, and then uh, I was talking with the, the head of knowledge, Leah Best, and saying we have a little bit of money uh, in our budget, not knowing what was ahead of us this event. Um, we should start building up some libraries that will help us work with new communities. And so I did some searching and tried to pull together a, a short library on, on the uh, uh, Vietnamese boat people who came in the 1970s. Um, am I still there? Okay, good. I was getting slight warnings on my screen. Uh, this is a book that's really interesting. If any of you ever find a copy, we would like one. I found four for sale in the US, all with writing and underlining. The books were $5, but they wanted $50 US to mail it to me. And I just couldn't bring myself to spend the taxpayer's money uh, for something that's not a good reading copy. So if anybody ever spots a copy of this book in a book bin or a library or, or sitting on a bookshelf of a friend, uh, we'd really like a copy of it. It was written a long time ago, but we're trying to get some of the key early books. 
And, and the reason for this is so that we can uh, improve our knowledge before we go to meet with the Vietnamese community and talk about their history and how would they like to be represented so that we can try and learn enough so that we will not make stupid mistakes or have some stereotypical understanding of their experience. Uh, this is one of the classics, which we did get. All the rest of these are, are here now. Uh, Strangers at the Gate, The Boat People's First Ten Years in Canada. So there's lots of books about Vietnam and the end of the war, but what we're interested in was how did you come here? What was it like when you arrived? What were the emotions? Uh, how did you feel as you became a British Columbian? And what was that process like? Um, a lot of people from Vietnam are Buddhist. And uh, this book, uh, we, we have a copy of it. Uh, Many Petals of the Lotus, Five Asian Buddhist Communities in Toronto. And they're all different and they have different backgrounds, but they all have Buddhism in common. Um, and you'll notice it says in Toronto. I find a lot of books about ethnic immigrants are usually about the experience in Toronto or in Montreal. It's the density of universities, the size of population, uh, but you'll find very few of them actually about Vancouver or British Columbia or Victoria. And when I did some work with the Italian communities, I found the experience in British Columbia was actually quite different than the experience in, uh, in Toronto and Montreal, particularly during World War II. Uh, the Italian population and trail continued to work uh, for Canada throughout the war. And so the whole issues of internment played out differently in BC than they did in Toronto or Montreal. Um, this is an interesting uh, pamphlet series that Canadian Historical Association, uh, up till about uh, 2005, I think, um, published a series of pamphlets which were for the classroom on different topics. And each author was a Canadian expert. So this is Louis-Jacques Doré, an anthropologist in Montreal. And the pamphlet is about the Cambodian, Laotian, and Vietnamese experience in Canada, written by an expert who has a string of books behind them uh, on these topics. Um, the interesting thing, and Kim will put this up in the chat at some point, is that these pamphlets are also available as PDFs, and you can download all of them, uh, or the ones that appeal to you, uh, from a website address that'll, that'll show up in the chat. Um, the reason I think the Canadian Historical Association stopped printing them is because research would move on and the pamphlet would be out of date. Um, could, could somebody different come and change another person's publication? And what if that person had passed away? And what are the ethics? Uh, and also they're expensive to print, expensive to distribute. This was before electronic books. Uh, and it just sort of petered away, but I think it's actually very useful. I'm very pleased that the CHA has put them online as a PDF. So go have a look if you want a little capsule history of, of moments in Canadian history, but be aware that they're not necessarily current or up to date. But this one is a very contemporary topic. Uh, it was booklet number 28 in the series. Um, okay. Now, if you were following um, the boat people in, in the Mediterranean uh, last year or the year before, uh, the whole world saw that, that tragic story, uh, photograph of the young drowned child uh, on the beach. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that the aunt of that boy lives in Vancouver and they were recently arrived immigrants from Syria. And Tima has written an autobiography, both about how she felt and about her nephew and, and also about their experience uh, coming from Syria and becoming new residents and British Columbians living in Vancouver. It's a very popular book, and I think you can get it as an, as an e-book. Uh, check on Amazon uh, for that. Um, because the books were at the museum and I was here, I've used a number of the covers that I got off the internet just to be able to show you the books that we've been collecting lately. Now, 
This one is also one of my uh, favorites. Um, the, the Bread and Salt Between Us, Recipes and Stories from a, refugee, a Syrian Refugee's Kitchen. Uh, Mayada Anjari with Jennifer Sit, I think. Um, it's, it's a lovely book. It's a great recipe book. Uh, but when I started in the museum um, back in 97, and I worked one of my first outreach projects was with the Italian community, what the ladies in the community taught me was about food as culture and food as learning. And, and anyone who's worked with the indigenous community knows that that's a basic, uh, uh, how you communicate and how you, you reinforce identity by the sharing of food. So on the one hand, this is a cookbook, but on the other hand, all of the recipes have some sort of cultural connection to understanding what events are important in the Syrian community. Um, I went down to the local Persian deli on Monday to get a, um, um, a falafel, and, uh, and it was the first day of Persian New Year. Um, and so the shop was all set up a little bit differently to celebrate the per Persian New Year. So recipe books, particularly from ethnic communities, are a really interesting entry into telling the story of identity and adaptation. And, and it is about sharing. And you're sharing not just food, you're sharing culture. Um, this book here by Paul uh, Eid, and forgive me if I mispronounce names, um, Being Arab, Ethnic and Religious Identity Building Among Second Generation Youth in Montreal. So there's that Montreal, Toronto publication thing. Does that apply to growing up in Vancouver? Uh, but this is kind of interesting because it's saying, you know, what happens when, when, when you're born here and you're trying to keep your identity, the identity of your parents and your grandparents, uh, what kind of tensions are, are there? Um, or if you're dealing with a society where everybody assumes you're recently arrived and you're not because you were born here. Uh, so I'm curious to read this book to see what the author has to say about the second generation experience and uh, multiple waves and multiple generations of immigrants. There's a lot of variety and diversity within each community. It, for the Italians, it mattered, did you come as a laborer in the 1920s working on railways, or were you university educated and arrived in the 1960s? You know, the, the Italy you left was different for each person. They left different time periods and they arrived to different experiences, and yet they are Italians together. Uh, so I'm very, very curious about multi-generational uh, uh, experience within communities and groups. Um, if you were a Sikh who arrived in 1910, uh, your experiences and, and your, uh, uh, the, the, the country you left is radically different than somebody who left in the 1970s. Uh, so that diversity within communities is always worth learning more about. Lauren. Um, not a very good image. Uh, I, even I can't read all the names of the authors. <laughs> Canadian Successes, a collection of success stories of successful Persian immigrants. And I kind of think this is interesting because for any ethnic community, there are these heroic success uh, uh, um, figures not all, many of them will not necessarily be in BC, but I'd like to know who uh, the community takes as a role model and, and what kind of areas were they successful in. Um, so that's sort of a, it's a modern take on the old biographies of successful merchants of 1910, but it's very up to date and it's very specific to the Persian ex experience in Canada. Um, Lauren, West, this West is, Edmonton Mall is one. Yeah. This is Kim. We just have, oh, I think this might even be your, almost your last slide. I was going to say we just have a few uh, minutes left, yep. uh, but it looks like we're, we're close. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, there's some links on here. If you can't read them, uh, Kim's going to put them into the chat. And uh, I'm pretty much done. If you have any questions and want to chat, happy to do that now. 
Um, I will, I think I will uh, unmute people in a second if you want to stop sharing your screen and we'll get back to our, we can go back to a, a list yeah. of all the participants and see that. I have a question for you, Lauren, about um, historical fiction. Yes. And I guess maybe some of the cautions you might have, or, or even if you like reading it. So I have here The Boat People by Sharon Butella, which talks about the Sri Lankan refugee crisis from, it, it, she never says Victoria, but a lot of what she describes makes it sound like this book is taking place in Victoria and Vancouver. And it certainly builds a lot of empathy uh, as a reader. You, you build maybe more empathy, but I'm sure you have to take a few caution precautions in mind what's something you think about when you're reading historical fiction um historical it depends on who's writing the historical fiction there's a fabulous early Sikh novel uh in which the four characters are laborers in a bunkhouse in a sawmill on the west fraser but the author uh went on to be the first Sikh in canada to get a phd and he's really sort of writing fiction about his experience, but writers write about things they know and things they've experienced. Uh, you know, it's not all fantasy creation just pulled out of the air. So it depends on who the writer is. And, you know, um, and that's, you know, you're into issues like authenticity of voice. But on the other hand, if, if, if a historical fiction really drags you into learning more about the topic, then it's a fabulous thing. Um, but uh, I used to do uh, poetry workshops uh, in parallel to my PhD, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about the appropriation of voice. Uh, so that's a whole sidebar. But uh, yeah. um, a good historical fiction is usually, if it's good, it's not just that the plot is good or that the writing is good. It usually means the research is also excellent. There's a, a question here um, from Lori Roche, and she's asking, uh, where does Joy Kagawa's Obasan fit into the museum's collection? Is that a book you're familiar with, Lauren? Uh, I, I am, uh, and uh, I know uh, her childhood home is a national historic site in Vancouver. Uh, the reason I'm not talking about it is uh, we have a team working specifically with the Nikkei Museum and with the University of Victoria and they're building an exhibit called Landscapes of Injustice. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been going through all of the records in the BC archives to look at the impact on families of property seizures, the failure to return things, uh, and to try and address all of that in an exhibit which is uh, coming up. It's one of our other uh, exhibit projects. Um, but, you know, these, these are tremendously important voices for the community, not only as uh, internal leaders and cultural leaders and voices, but also because they bring the issues to the national stage, whether it's literary or your library. Oh, that was something else I wanted to say. Um, there's a link to our publications, which are eBooks, um, uh, and, and Kim will probably drop that in, uh, um. in the chat. But also, um, our publisher said, remind people that the libraries might be closed, but they're not closed for you signing out e-books. So don't forget about your public libraries. You can, you can sign books out using your library card electronically if you want to read it on your Kobo or your tablet at home. Um, so yeah. libraries are not closed. They're, they're but, available. That's a good tip. Uh, I thought maybe also we could ask, uh, I've unmuted everyone, uh, if you are, if you have a favorite historical book, uh, it could be about BC or something else, and you would like to share it to give people something to add to their reading list, feel free to, to jump out loud, I guess, to speak up is what I should say, and, uh, and let us know, or you can type it into the chat window there. Uh, that chat window can be saved and can be shared. And, and I would second that. I mean, this is my attempt at trying to find books that would be useful if we're going to, to work with the community. Um, one I don't have a picture for is uh, St. Joseph's Parish in Vancouver published a hundred year history uh, in 2011. Uh, but I was really excited about this one, not because it was a history of a Roman Catholic parish, but because the last three priests are Vietnamese immigrants. 
Yeah. And the parish is a hub for Roman Catholic Vietnamese immigrants in Vancouver. And the 100 year history of that church is published in English and Vietnamese. Mm. And it emphasizes families and the family experience. So when you can find something like that, you go, these would be wonderful people to partner with because not all people from Vietnam are Buddhist. Some of them are Roman Catholic because of the long colonial experience with the French and, and, and the Portuguese and so forth. Um, so if anybody is aware of any books that they think are really interesting and useful, particularly privately published, uh, small, those small run books that for, for you it hit home on, on the emotional and real experience of becoming a British Columbian and leaving one country and arriving here. We'd love to know about those books. If, uh, if you're watching this afterwards, or if you're thinking of, if you're watching this recording, or if you are thinking about this later and an idea comes up, you can share those books with us online as well. You can um, tweet us or uh, send a picture of the book on our Instagram page at uh, Royal BC Museum. That would be great. Um, Laurie Roche here. Um, uh, thank you, Lauren, for your um, answer to the Obasan book. I just happened to pick it up of, out of my, down, my downstairs library the other day and realized I hadn't read it for years. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, that's another one to kind of to try to have a look at it. Very interesting to read it you know, uh, a couple of decades later and to see the differences between how I thought about that first and, and what is happening now, um, just in, in terms of, of the whole experience. So it's just, it, just, it just is top of mind right now for me. So I'm glad to hear that something's being done with it, uh, done with the whole thing, um, you know, coming up in another exhibit. Uh, it, it's it's actually um, the University of Victoria got the funding and early on asked us if we'd be involved in helping them build the exhibit and giving you know um, support for their students doing the archival research and and support of course to the Nikai uh, Center in Vancouver. Um, so it, it's actually been a five year project. So we're just coming to the conclusion and being able to share the results. And uh, I think the students have also gotten a great deal out of it. There, there are master students at work. And, um, it's gonna be co quite interesting. So for some of these projects, you have to dig in for the long haul mm. um, and, and you need partnerships. And the, it's a good example of successful partnership, I th think. People will be hearing more about it as, as things go on. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and, and again, you know, you, you, you can't capture the human experience without considering fiction, poetry, the arts, um, uh, playwrights, all of that. It's, it's simply not, you know, a chronological history book. It's more than that. Um, when, I, when I was working with Italian immigrants, one of the things that hit me was in every living room I went into in Kamloops or, or in Trail, uh, People who arrived in a certain decade, they all had the same rights from home, the pop records and so forth. And when they had community dances, there were a couple of favorite songs and they reflected the country that they came from at that moment in time. So culture is a big part of this. Well, everyone, I'm really happy you joined us today. I, I'm proud to also say historians are already calling this the first of the Royal BC Museum at Home series. Uh, you can join us next, uh, join us this Thursday uh, with Dr. Henry Chum, and he's going to talk about some research, a research trip, research he did on a trip to Japan and how that's related to what he's working on from home today. I'll be sharing that link again with uh, our volunteers and we'll be trying this one more time before we go um, live with the public. If you haven't had enough of Lauren and you want to see some more of him, check out our RBCM YouTube channel. Uh, our This Week in History series features Lauren and many of our other curators talking about objects in the collection. It's uh, 
engaging and fun. You'll see a lot of great images and there's a lot of terrific stories on there. So, and also please keep looking at our uh, website, following us online. We'll be posting more about our digital engagement opportunities. We want to see more of you. We want to stay in touch and uh, the museum, of course, we look forward to inviting everyone back. Hello. Hello, hello. I'm How are you? Mute. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to inviting you all back uh, as soon as we possibly can. So I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, the, we'll stay open here in the chat window if folks want to, do, um, to continue chatting for a little bit longer. And I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Bye-bye. Thank you for dialing in. Do people dial? Yes. I think they do. I think they do. <laughs>